Okay, so you're all very welcome. Dia of Gathana, Tafalter of Koch, La Ela Forex, Son of Dia of Galer. Happy St. Patrick's Day to you all, and you're all really welcome. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Siobhan Armstrong. I'm the founding director of the Historical Harp Society of Ireland. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you all here today for. Uh, what is uh, a Discovery Day event for 2021? Normally, we have Discovery Days each year where we have a talk, a concert, and a workshop. But since we can't do that right now, we're celebrating St. Patrick's Day with you uh, with a talk on um, our and to launch our Hollybrook project and to introduce you to all the new free online resources uh, that we present in this project with a wealth of downloadable material that you can all have access to. So to give us a tour around uh, the Hollybrook project, there's no one better than Dr. Karen Loomis, who is the principal investigator of the project, who has put together all these resources uh, with the assistance of Simon Chadwick, her research associate, who's also here with us today. So hi, Simon, we'd like to welcome you too. Um, based in the USA, I consider Karen Loomis, a geologist in the world for early Irish harp, uh, which means she analyzes the construction and the craftsmanship of early Irish harps and uh, uncovering a wealth of information about them uh, that we didn't know before. Um, before we begin, before I hand you over to Karen, there are a few uh, thank yous that I'd like to make. Firstly, to Ancorla Allian, uh, the Irish Arts Council, uh, who kindly funded uh, this project as a, on a once-off basis. Um, so if you'd like to see more of this kind of work, um, feel free to donate to us. And if you want us to ring fence uh, your donation for further scientific work on early Irish harps, we'd be more than happy to do that. Uh, we're unveiling two new websites in the next fortnight, um, a revamp of our existing website, um, irishharp.org. Uh, and from there, you'll also be able to get to our new festival website for our summer festival, which takes place for the first time in July this year, from the 25th to the 29th of July. And also for the first time, it's an online festival. So um, any of you who are in distant parts of the world who find it difficult to get to Kilkenny for our summer festival, who have ever wanted to join us, this is your year. You can join, you can join us from your living room. So uh, check out our new uh, festival when it comes online. It's completely interactive, tickets online. Uh, we'll be delighted if you can join us then as well. Um, uh, another big thank you goes to the National Museum of Ireland who kindly facilitated um, our research project and um, allowed Aaron and Simon to be at the museum uh, for quite a few days to accomplish the work. Um, and lastly, we'd like to thank Brenda Malloy who provided material assistance on the day on those days at the National Museum. Um, so without further ado, I hand you over to uh, Karen Loomis. Great, thank you so much. And yes. Uh, yeah, so we're recording now. And I'm going to, uh, in a moment here, I'll, I'll share my screen. And again, as Siobhan pointed out, this is, this is a casual walkthrough. So uh, I'm hoping people weren't expecting a formal PowerPoint presentation and if you were dreading a formal PowerPoint presentation, you're in luck because you're not getting one. <laughs> but uh, we're here today because, um, as Siobhan mentioned, we're, we're launching the, um, the um, web-based um, resource for the Hollybrook Harp Project. And that is a, a massive database of uh, information and uh, images and, and data uh, that we've uh, created from the our Hollybrook research that we Simon and I did a year ago at the National Museum of Ireland. And uh, just to uh, give you a little quick background about the Hollybrook Harp and this project, and some of you uh, were may have heard some of this before if you were at the talk I gave at the Somerset Harp Festival last summer. Um, so this is a little bit of a recap for you guys. For those of you who missed that talk, that's actually archived at the Somerset Harp Festival this year. So 
for those of you who are interested, if you sign up for that harp festival, you can actually get access to that talk again. Uh, Holly Brook Harp is at the National Museum of Ireland. It's an early Irish harp, circa 18th century. We believe it's one of the 18th century harps. It's a, what's known as a high-headed early Irish harp. Um, so the, that's the, the later style of early Irish harp where the, it has the longer bass strings and a taller four pillar than the earlier early Irish harps, like uh, for example, like the Brian Boulou harp at Trinity College. Um, the Hollybrook harp is called the Hollybrook because it uh, was for many years at Hollybrook House and it was um, purchased at auction by the National Museum of Ireland in 1986 for, I think it was for, uh, I want to say 3,200 pounds. Um, it was purchased from the descendants of Robin Adair. And Robin Adair was, um, he lived in the uh, late 17th, early 18th century. He was a member of the Irish gentry and he was famous for uh, being a very good host and uh, you know, have entertaining people at Hollybrook. Um, and actually he was really well known for um, his, he had these giant wine glasses at his house that were like huge. They would hold a quart of wine each and, and he would um, tell unsuspecting guests that you know, he would offer them a glass of wine and say, oh, but you have to drink it, drink the whole glass in one go, you know, not, and of course, them not realizing it was this enormous glass. So this was kind of a, a running joke with him. But he was known for his hospitality and also known, uh, I guess, later on known as, you know, sort of a, a, a poet and, and, a, and a creative person. Um, and there was a, a song uh, written in his honor called Robin Adair, uh, to the tune of Eileen Arun. Um, and um, I, I, Simon has a, a blog post about Robin Adair. If you want to go to his website and, and read a little bit more about him and the history of Hollybrook. Um, Simon, did you want to say a couple of words about the provenance of this harp? Because Although the, the family uh, history is that this was the harp of Robin Adair, uh, according to his descendants, but Simon did a little bit of, in, you know, investigating on in, um, this provenance. And apparently there's, there's no mention of this harp until like the 19th century. Is that right, Simon? Yeah, so I, I, there's, there's two things that I wrote. The first thing, I, the first thing was so at the time, a year ago, when we were working on it, I tried to track down him and his genealogy and descendants and how he fits into Hollybrook House. And he's a real person. And we can work out who his parents and descendants are. And so that's that's what's all on my blog post. But the thing, the thing I did as part of this project, which is up on the project website, and I'm not finding it in my notes here, here it is, is that I started to doubt this thing. So Karen's mentioned the stories about Robin Adair, that he had these amazing wine glasses. There's a famous story about um, a Scottish champion drinker coming to Ireland and going to Hollybrook House and there being a great challenge. Like this Scottish man said, well, I can drink more than anybody. And so he and Robin Adair had a match and of course Robin won and the poor Scottish champion was sent home with his tail between his legs. And I thought this is, this is a big contrast this kind of hard drinking macho manly thing and it contrasts with this idea of sitting playing the harp and writing poetry and being inspired and so as far as i can see these two stories fit into two time periods so in the earlier time period you have the hard drinking robin adair and then the house was rebuilt in um the 1830s and they, they demolished the old house and they built this really fancy new Tudor style building in the 1830s. And it seems to be that they were trying to cash in. They're in County Wicklow, they're not far from Dublin. And people had started doing tours out of the city to, to go to the country houses. And I think they wanted people to go to Hollybrook. 
as, as tourists. And so they had this story about Robin Adair. They had a little grotto in the garden. This is where Robin sat and had his poetic inspiration. And they had a harp in the house. This is the harp of Robin Adair. And, and I'm just wondering if that if the harp was purchased and put in the house at that point, because there's no mention of the harp in the house before the 1830s, but they're all talking about it afterwards. So that was my thought, but I can't prove any of this, but it is my suspicion. Thanks, I, thank you. Yeah, I, it, make, it, it just adds to the interesting background about this harp. So, so we don't know for certain, as Simon pointed out, if this harp actually did belong to Robin Adair, it, it, it does appear likely that it it's broadly dates to his time period. So it's certainly possible that it did belong to him, but it would be nice to have a little bit more direct evidence linking the harp to him. Now, um, okay, so the project is, so uh, a year ago, January, Simon and I, went to the National Museum of Ireland and we spent a week there in their collection center uh, analyzing the harp. We did, um, we had it laser scanned or, or rather 3D scanned, which gives you a uh, recording of the, um, all the surfaces, all of the accessible surfaces of the harp uh, so that you can view it as a computer model and take really accurate measurements to your heart's content and do cross sections and all sorts of good stuff like that. We did a comprehensive photo survey of the harp in visible light and in ultraviolet light. Um, the reason we did ultraviolet light was uh, because we were hoping to be able to see some of the decorative work. Now this harp, if if you read about this harp in Robert Bruce Armstrong's book, he talks about this, uh, the decorative work on the, the instrument um, as being very ornate, uh, golden uh, motifs of birds and flowers and people. It sounds like he's describing Japaning, which is a, a type of uh, a lacquer finish that um that is in imitation of east asian lacquerware and most people have seen japan objects even if you don't know the term uh, it has very glossy fi d finish uh, usually it's a dark background with you know gold motifs of exotic uh east asian inspired scenes and and plants and people and it was a enormously popular in Europe in the 17th and 18th centuries. I mean, everybody wanted to have something that was Japan. Uh, and there's even some his, historical information uh, from the memoirs of uh, O'Neill. He, he mentions another harper having a harp sent to a Japaner to have it done. So it's quite possible that some of the early Irish harps in the 18th century were Japan. And certainly Armstrong's description makes it sound like the Hollybrook harp might have been one of those instruments. But if you look at it today, it's just brown. And uh, you can't really see any decorative work on it. And so we were hoping to be able to see the decorative work um, through you know, either ultraviolet light photography or infrared photography. Um, we also did, um, brought an endoscope and we put that inside the sound box uh, so that we could get into some of the less accessible areas of the sound box inside and we did some photography inside there. We did um, measurements of uh, gauges of existing strings. Uh, let's see, I'm trying to think what else we did. I should probably look at the list. Actually, what I think what I'll do is I will go ahead and screen share because it'll probably be easier if I just show you what we've got online. So I'm going to turn on screen sharing right now. Sorry, uh, there's a Rachel trying to get in. Oh, thank you very much. Hang on a second. Let me not screen share right now. Let me enter, let people in. Thanks for pointing that out to me. 
because when I screen share, I might not be able to see the people getting in, or the people waiting in the waiting room. So I'm going to go ahead and share. Okay. Okay, so if you go to the Historical Harp Society of Ireland website, and as Sean mentioned, as Siobhan mentioned, the we've got a revamped website about to launch, uh, but it's already the resource is already available on the current website, and it will be available on the new website as a link. But the current website, if you just go to resources, and actually you'll see Hollybrook. And let me see if I can click on that. There we go. So we've got a web page and all of the files are uh, organized together in Dropbox. Everything is downloadable. The web page gives you uh, some background information on the project. The reason we decided to do the Hollybrook harp was because it's a high-headed harp and the repertory that Bunting preserved in his manuscript sources is for the, the players from the 18th century and nearly all of those players, all those harpers were playing high-headed harps. So that repertory is, most of it is for high-headed early Irish harps. So for people who want to have, a, want to explore that repertory and want to explore it on a replica of an historical instrument, this would be an appropriate instrument to do that on, you know, a replica of this instrument. Um, another reason we decided to do this harp and to do this project is to make it easier to have these harps made. The, if you are a harp maker, you you might have you might not have the resources to get to the National Museum of Ireland or to get to some other museum and gather all of the, the information and all of the data and process it. If you're the museum, you also have a dilemma because what often happens with historical musical instruments, including these early Irish harps, is um, a harp maker may contact the museum and say, hey, I'd like to measure the harp. Can, you know, can I have access to it? Well, a month later, someone else might contact the museum and say the same thing. And then, you know, a couple of weeks later, someone else might. And this, this happens fairly often, particularly with instruments for which there's a steady stream of people who would like to have replicas made of that. And the museums have a dilemma because they have an obligation to uh, be a public service and to make these artifacts available for study to benefit everybody, but they also have to caretake those artifacts. And every time one of these musical instruments is taken out to be measured and examined, there's always the danger of wear and tear. And there's so few of these harps left. So they have to balance that. And one solution is to have you know one person or one research group go in and get as much data as possible and make it available to the community so that everybody get benefits. And that's why we did this. So the, we're just, I'm just scrolling through the web page, and hopefully you guys can see this. Unfortunately, while I'm screen sharing, I cannot see the chat window. So if you have a question for me, please feel free to unmute yourself and speak up uh if at any point here don't you know don't be shy don't feel like you have to wait till the end because unfortunately i can't see your chat window while i'm screen sharing so i'd love to hear you don't don't worry about interrupting me so if you if i do something you or you want me to do something else just speak up there's no problem uh, on the web page you will see a set of links for the project database and you can either go to the top level link or if you just want to look at one area like the 3D scan, you can click on that. Um, I've got it divided up into um, the full project report, which is a PDF that you can download that gives all the background information on the project, plus 
on each of the different parts of the project. And it's really just informational. Uh, in fact, let me just click on that so you can see that. And just give it a second to load. And you can either view it directly on Dropbox or you can download this file. And again, this is the introductory information. It also has links to all of the data in the project and it's all organized for ease of navigation. So if you want to, you can click on a project top level link And what you will see is a just a brief uh, paragraph telling you what you've got there. This is the top level of the database. Everything here is freely downloadable. And everything has a little brief PDF exp explanatory file to tell you what is there and what the data is and how we took it. And so if you click on 3D scan, for those of you who feel comfortable working with this 3D scan files, the file, the original files are here and you can just, you can download them and use them yourself. There's also a PDF explaining what's there. So this gives you some background information on what the 3D scan is with links to the to the scan data and also information on, um, let's see, on what we did with the scan data. And I'll talk about that in a second. So this is background information on the scan and on our output. For those people who want to, who haven't worked with 3D scans before but want to try it out. There's also information on where you can download free software for viewing the 3D scan. We used MeshLab and it allows you to view the scan and also manipulate it. If For those of you who just want to look at the web page and see what's there, you can read about project highlights and in fact Simon has set up the web page so you can actually view a preview of the 3D scan right on the web page. And it just takes a moment to load. So this just gives you a little bit of a preview that you can just see right on the web page. And you can turn the scan around. And I think you can even zoom in. Let me see. Yeah, you can zoom in on it. So without having to download anything or do any software, you can actually just go to the web page on the Historical Harp Society of Ireland website and look at the scan and uh, read more about it. Uh, also on the web page, you can see a little video clip of this, the um, harp being scanned. Uh, again, we had it done by 3D Printing Ireland. That's Kieran McCormick of 3D Printing Ireland there scanning the harp. You can also read on the web page uh, just a little introductory information about some of the highlights of the project. We did um, image the decorative work under ultraviolet light. And I have a write-up about that on our in our database and you can click directly through to that. And again, all of this is downloadable. So if you just want, if you're just interested in the decorative work, you can read about that. And not only that, you say, wow, this write-up is really cool. But the write-up is just the introduction. If you, if you like what you see in the write-up, you can then, oh, I want to see more of this. Let me click on this link and it will take me straight to the photographic survey and I can see the images. So these are processed photographs. So this is actually just a curated subset of the photographic survey. We've got over, a, I think well over a thousand photographs. Actually the complete, all of the, there's a 900 image photographic survey with a big camera and then um, a few hundred more images with 
smaller handheld cameras. So this is a curated subset of the um, photography uh, focusing on the uh, decorative work. And I've, I've organized it all in uh, matched sets of images. So for example, this is an ultraviolet image of the base end of the harp. And on each image, you can see I've got information on the image of what it is and what the raw image name is. And this is actually a com combination of two ultraviolet images. And if we go back, to the list, there are actually three trimmed and matched images of the same object. So if you if you want, you can actually blink through those and compare them directly with one another because the image dimensions are, are matched and they're aligned. This is actually a combination of visible light and ultraviolet light. And oops, this is the visible light image of the same object. Um, same part of the harp. And let's see if we can go to one that's a little bit more interesting. Um, as you can see that so I've got I've set made up this curated set that's you know all parts of the outside of the harp. So for example let's go to I don't know box left motif 03. What's that? Okay so here's an ultraviolet image of part of the left side of the harp. I've got a little inset here that shows you exactly where on the harp that is. And I've even put on the inset, I don't know you can see it on your computer screen, but if you download this, this image, it, there's a grid on there that's to scale. So for those of you who want to, you know, take measurements, if you wanted to replicate this decorative work and you really want to know what the scale is on there, there's a, there's a scale grid on there that you can do that. And I'm just checking. I can't tell if I've got new participants waiting. So if somebody wants to, oh, there is somebody waiting. Oh, great. Okay. Um, if you want to know what that particular part of the harp looks like in visible light, the image is right there. That's what it looks like to the naked eye. And this is what it looks like. This is a combined image, uh, visible light and under ultraviolet light. So you can see that the harp had this model background. That was the, the background uh, motif or, or, or style. And um, what you're seeing in silhouette there is one of the decorative motifs. And the reason it appears black on that image is, I believe, because the process of Japaning uses gum arabic to build up the the decorations and gum arabic absorbs ultraviolet light so when we photographed the harp under ultraviolet light all of the decorative motifs showed up in silhouette as black you can't see any gold on the harp any we believe according to armstrong that these uh, motifs were golden uh, originally and that's all gone now, it's all worn off. Um, so you have to imagine that this would have been, originally it would have had this mottled background, red and brown or, or red and, and green or greenish brown. And on top of that, there would have been these uh, decorations of, of flowers and, and there's birds and leaves in gold, although not actual gold, they probably used something like brass dust, something golden and shiny to make it stand out. And Armstrong says they were outlined in black to make them make them you know stand out against the background. And the background would have looked something like like tortoise shell, which was a really popular uh, style of background in the 18th century. So the harp would have looked really amazing. You have to kind of envision it in your mind's eye. Let me see if I can bring up quickly a picture of the whole harp. But as you can see, as I'm quickly scrolling through here, um, I've, I've got images of the whole thing there. And I don't want to spend too much time on this because I know I, I want to show you the rest of what we got there. But this is really cool stuff. And all of this is available for you to download. 
And again, it's all organized for to make it easy for people to find stuff. So for example, if you want to see other photographs, if you want to see the whole photo survey, um, this is all of the photos. If I click on this, this has 900 photo photographs of the harp taken with the, the bigger camera. And I've got it all organized and I've, I've labeled the images um, so to make it easier for people to see what that image is, whether it was done under visible light or infrared or, or ultraviolet light. And that's all explained in the write-up for the photo survey, which you can download right here. And if you go to the top link, you can see there's um, a folder for the 3D scan, a folder for all the photos, and all of the write-ups. We have one on the construction, which gives you background on the construction, and again, has links to all of the, the data and further information, has links to the 3D scans, the photos, and 3D scan folder with the data, and in addition to background information on the construction. We, um, we were able to use the scans to do a contour map of part of the, the soundboard, which is really useful because it gives you a um, thickness map of, the, of that part of the soundboard. And that's in there, and that's also downloadable as a separate, separate file so that you can get it at full scale. Um, in the 3D scan folder, let me make sure I'm, before I go to that, I, I just want to back up for a second and, and tell you the write-ups that we have. We have one on construction, one on decorative work, one on the history of the harp, uh, one that is just the full, all of the write-ups together, that's the full report. We have one that's uh, an introduction to the project one on the stringing, and one on wear marks on the harp. The 3D scan folder has not only the raw scan files, and I know not everybody feels comfortable working with the 3D scan software. Um, if you do feel comfortable, all the files are in there, and you can download them. Uh, but if you're not, uh, we've created processed scan output. So for example, you can click on, if you click on four pillar, you get a set of prepared cross sections of the four pillar. I did one that's, this is just from the side, and this is all to scale, and, and you can download all of these files. This is just a preview of the file, but you can download these, and they are one-to-one -one scale, and they have a scale grid background and uh, the background actually goes down to one millimeter if you view it at full scale. And I've got uh, a, a series of cross sections down the length of the four pillar. And again, it's all, if you print it out at full size, it's all one-to-one -one scale. And if you view it in image viewing software, you can take measurements off of, off of the image directly because I have scaled the pixels in the image. So you can get uh, sections of the whole four pillar and also there's a reference image that shows you where the cross sections that I prepared are on the four pillar. And I've done that for each part of the heart. So let me just go back to cross sections. I also have done um, views of the four pillar. So it's either orthographic views, so they're they're uh, planar views, so there there's no distortion from you know your your viewpoint. Um, so you can look at the four pillar from all sides. And 
And I've done that for the full harp and for the neck and for the sound box. So for example, the sound box. I've got cross sections and orthographic views and the soundboard map. And again, all of this is downloadable. So for again, for those of you who don't feel comfortable working with the computer model, um, it's all here uh, ready for you to use. You, you don't have to work with it if you don't want to. And I did cross sections of the sound box at each of the string holes. Now, a, a laser scan or a 3D scan is not the same thing as a CT scan, so it can't see through the wood. Um, so it's really only recording the surface. So when you do a cross section, you're not, you know, unless you get the, the scanner inside the harp, you, you can't see through the harp, but it gives you the, the outer dimensions. However, because this harp has a nice big access hole in the back side, uh, we were able to get the scanner inside part to see part of the inside of the sound box. And for those parts, we were able to get, see the whole view there. So that's what you can see in 3D scan. And just to, in case I missed something. So we've got processed output and then we have the original full um, resolution scan file, an information PDF to explain what's there. And that the full resolution scan file is a, is a big file that you, might not be easy to manage on your computer. So Simon has prepared some lower resolution files for those of you who want to work with a 3D scan, but your computer may be not up to the task. So you can do that if you want. And in the photos, you've got compact camera photos that we, these were just handheld cameras that we went around and got to areas of the harp that were a little bit harder to do in the, with the larger camera. And there's a write up on that. And all of the, all the photos are in there. It's all downloadable. You can also all preview all of it without downloading it, which is kind of nice. So you can see what you, what we've got there before you commit to downloading anything. We did microscopy. So I had a, a USB microscope and all the microscopy images are in there and a write up on them. And um, some of them are more interesting than others. Um, probably the most interesting ones is I, we took uh, images of the ends of the tuning pins and some of them you can see where the string wear is on the, on the tuning pin, which gives you an idea of the direction of the winding in the tuning pin. And I, I talk about that in the construction, actually no, in the tuning pin write-up. So let me just go back here. I've shown you the photo survey and the process photos, and I also have photos of the interior of the sound box. For, so if you're just interested in seeing the inside of the sound box, uh, you can just go straight there. There's a write-up there as well that talks about the what we did to photograph the inside of the sound box with links to everything. So you can always just go straight to the write-up and click on a link in there and it will take you right to the data. And again, uh, the write-ups will, will give you the background information for everything. And each write-up has the links that take you straight to the data in the Dropbox. Um, Simon, did you want to talk about anything? Like for example, Simon did a really wonderful job doing the stringing analysis for us. Simon is, I think, the most um, experienced person I can think of on the string of the early Irish harps. And um, we um, used the 3D scan to measure the, the string lengths. Actually, I, what I did was I measured the, 
the coordinates of the ends of the pins and of the string holes. So you can actually, that allows you to uh, explore different stringing arrangements, whether you go from tuning pin one to string hole one or from tuning pin one to string hole number two, for example. And Simon took that information and um, worked up a reconstructed stringing regime for the harp. And Simon, did you want to say anything about that? Yeah, um, well, there's two things about the string. One is that there's, there are old strings on the harp. And so we measured as many as we could, which is very difficult because they're so fragile and you have to use a plastic measuring thing that's not very accurate. We tried to measure the strings that were on it and tried to work out, is it possible that they were old music strings? And I think the conclusion is they're not because they're far too thick. Um, so, but still, the data's there if anyone wants to work at it. And then the second thing I tried to do is to come up with a, a working string regime so that if a harp maker wants to make a replica of the harp, then they've got a chart that they can use to string the harp up. And I think this harp would work very well all in yellow brass. And, I, and my chart shows it down with um, five strings below Cronan G. So that's two strings more than the downhill harp has, which I think is a nice kind of typical range for one of these big Irish harps. We've got two different charts that Bunting made transcriptions of from the old harpers from two different people, I think, showing that many bass strings. And there's links to his manuscripts in the report so that you can compare what I've done with what Bunting tells us. And I'm looking forward to seeing harps with this string, replica harps with this string on to see what they sound like and how they work. Great, thanks Simon. Yeah, uh, absolutely. And um, one of the reasons we decided to do this harp, uh, although I have to confess I was really, I was intrigued by the decorative work, but one of the reasons we decided to do this harp was because it has a pieced sound box. And one of the difficulties for harp makers, and certainly the harp makers that are here today can tell you, is a, a lot of the, typically the early Irish harp was made with a sound box out of a single large timber that's hollowed out. And it can be hard to find a piece of wood that is big enough and suitable to make a sound box out of. And if there's any harp makers here, feel free to, to speak up and say, yeah, that's been my experience. But some of the early, surviving early Irish harps have sound boxes that are made from separate planks. And this is one of them. Um, and my hope Karen, is, I, yep. I, I would say that of all the ones with pieced sound boxes, this is perhaps the most sophisticated because it's quite a strongly arched front panel. It's not just a flat plank glued on. It's got this, well, you can you can talk about the, the rebate and the arching. But mm, yeah, thanks for pointing that out, Simon. That's a really good point. Yeah, it's a nice harp. It's, again, it's got the piece sound box, so that may be a little bit easier for harp makers who are having trouble sourcing large timbers to make sound boxes. Um, and as Simon pointed out, it's it's really a, a nicely made instrument, and uh, it's also of a fairly modest size uh, for a high-headed harp. It's uh, one of the smaller ones, if not the smallest. Um, and this, what you're seeing on my screen right now, is in the construction overview. I I combined the information that we had from the 3D scan and from all of our photography, and I did a diagram. Uh, which again is available separately. It's in this write-up, but also you can just download the original image, which is, I made one-to-one -one scale um, that shows the internal construction of the sound box for, for the harp makers out there. And Simon mentioned that the, 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 it's rabbited there. Uh, you can see the, the soundboard is separate. And again, this image is also available uh, to download at full scale for those of you who want to see that a little bit better, the way the soundboard is attached to the sides here. Now, it looks like it's got like blobs here. That's actually an artifact of the 3D scanning. It's just because um, the, this area here 
is where the, the scanner couldn't reach. So wherever it can't reach to see looks solid inside the, the sound box there. So it doesn't actually have a big blobby back to it. So this image that you're looking at right here is a cross section of the sound box. And uh, if you actually download this, and, and I know it's hard to see on the preview, but I actually show where that cross section is. So it's as if you were in, if your head was inside the sound box and you're seeing the outline of the sound box there. Um, I would like to, at this point, open it up to questions because I, I feel badly because I feel like I've been hopping around from, from place to place and maybe I've been not been explaining things as thoroughly as I could. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop screen sharing, but I can always start it up again if people want to. But if people have questions, I would love to hear. And I and I apologize if I have missed anything that anybody said in the chat window. Um, so so okay. fire away, people. Yes. Uh, Karen, somebody uh, uh, asked in the chat window if a replica of this harp had been made. Um, so I just wanted to point out that um, I can see Kevin Harrington is with us today. Um, he's an Irish harp builder who's based in Wicklow, um, just south of Dublin. And he built um, a Hollybrook harp for one of my students uh, last year. But that was before he had access to all of this. So I imagine if he built another one, it might be slightly different. Yeah, Kevin, do you want do you want to say anything, Kevin? Do you want to unmute yourself and say what it was like to build a Hollybrook replica? Uh, yeah, can you hear me there? All right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it was very interesting. All right, um, making it, you know, especially as it is a glued together box, without that information, you know, I was completely at sea about so much uh, of the joinery, how, how to actually put it together. Um, for instance, I did a mitered corners on all four corners, but I see now that that was incorrect. You know, I wouldn't say, by the way, that it was a replica either. It was very much, um, uh, yeah, I mean, you, you can't really say it's a replica with the amount of information that I had at the time. But um, no, I'm, I'm really, really looking forward now to going through everything that you've done there. There's so much information and there, all the cross sections and everything. My God, it's, <laughs> I'm, I'm giddy looking at it, you know. So, um, yeah, it'll be brilliant, be brilliant. Can't wait. Karen, I have to tell you, it takes a lot to impress man. So if, if work is impressed with work, you've done well there. <laughs> Thank you. It, 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 was a, it was a team effort. It was a team effort, so. And, any other questions? Yeah, I, I, I hope that, uh, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, and Simon's also happy to answer questions. I would love Karen, to hear I think what... somebody was asking about what wood it was made from. Oh, I'm glad you asked that, or I'm glad whoever asked that. That's one of the things we don't know. So for this project, we needed to limit ourselves to what's called non-destructive analysis, which means looking but not taking samples. Uh, we would need to get further permission from the National Museum of Ireland in order to take samples for wood species identification. And we would also have to bring in um, um, a, a, a botanist or someone who is has the skills to take the samples because you have to actually, um, not only do you have to be careful about damaging the instrument, but the samples have to be taken in a specific way so that you reveal the um, the three axes of the wood because wood is a has a three dimensional structure to it in order to do um, a positive identification. Um, so I, I would go ahead, Simon. Yeah, I would say that we don't know that about this heart, but we do have that information with quite a few others. The ones that Karen did in Edinburgh and the, and the other ones in the National Museum that were done in the nineteen sixties. So I guess if you're a heart maker and you have that question. Yeah, the, the quick answer is, is we have no idea, but the slow answer is you can kind of triangulate all the other data from the other harps to come up with a to come up with plausible suggestions of what kind of wood might be suitable for it. Yeah, good point, Simon. And one of the things that we we had thought about doing that unfortunately 
uh, we weren't able to do was uh, weighing the harp. Uh, we, Simon and I each were uh, a little bit limited to the uh, equipment that we could carry in and carry out with us. Um, so, you know, whatever fits on a train or in an airplane. And a bathroom scale was one of the things that got jettisoned. Um, but my impression, and, and, I'll, and Simon can either agree or disagree, was my impression was this harp was fairly light uh, in terms of weight. Um, so, you know, it's entirely possible that it's willow. I don't want to say that it is because we don't know, but I'm interested, Simon, what do you think about the weight of the harp when we were moving it around? Yeah, I would say it's something lightweight and soft and open grained like willow or alder. Willow and alder are two woods that have been identified in other harps of this date. So it's, it's that kind of thing, I would think. And the other thing I would say is that, um, with the in the pocket camera photo sets, I was there. There are places where the wood is damaged at the edge, and I was did, I was trying to take photographs of those edges of wood to give you an impression of the texture and the fibres. And obviously, you can't make a positive identification from that, but it can give you a feel for the kind of wood it is. Thanks, Simon. Oh, Simon, someone has asked a question. Uh, it, Cindy pointed out that uh, could you say something about repertoire? Repertoire, because I think someone earlier asked a question, it, do we know of any repertoire for this harp specifically? No, because we don't know who had this harp before the 1830s. We know it was at Hollybrook House as a, as a non-working ornament hanging on the wall in the 19th century, but we don't, you know, they said it belonged to Robin Adair, but I don't believe them. You can if you want, nobody knows. So then you have to talk generally about what's a suitable repertory for 18th century harps. This is, I guess this is where we look at what Bunting collected from the 18th century harpers and the, and the music that he transcribed from the harpers that is in his manuscripts. And I don't know if we can also think about, I don't know if the Japan thing places this harp in a different social or cultural world, or if that would be considered normal. Maybe you could say something about that, Karen. Does that does, is, well, does, that, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting point, Simon. In fact, uh, as as Eilish pointed out to me when when she and I were were chatting a, a couple of months ago, um, if it was Robin Adair's harp, uh, he was a, in a member of the Irish gentry, and so he would have been in a different social class than perhaps the Irish, some of the, many of the Irish harpers of this time. And Eilish should pointed out, you know, there is a crown ornamentation on the neck, um, which, you know, this kind of, what does that say about the, 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 the social class that this harp belonged to? Um, and sir, one of the things that strikes me about this instrument and that may affect the way that we think about these 18th century Irish harps, or that some of us think about them, is now that we've been able to, you know, see some of the decorative work under ultraviolet light, uh, we can have a better idea of what this instrument would have looked like when it was new. And um, you have to use your imagination a little bit, but I would, well, for one thing, I would love to, I would love if someone decided to do a full right. a full replica of this with the decoration but it would have been um you know think about an 18th century french harpsichord for example with the ornate decoration on the instrument um you know some of them were japanned um a, a really nicely done ground with uh ornate uh, flowers and birds uh, in gold, and um, and all sort of tricked out with with little golden golden embellishments here and there, and nice and uh, really uh, lustrous looking. I right heard. now it looks it you know now it looks very humble and plain brown, and that affects how we think of these instruments when we see them in their current state. They look very humble, but when this was new in the 18th century, it would have been really ornate looking. It would have been something to show off and say, wow, you know, hey, there's our amazing looking harp. 
And if you were someone sitting in an audience or, or sitting you know, in a great house somewhere and, and watching and listening to this being played, that would have had an impression. Has anyone tried to do a, a color drawing reconstruction, just easier than doing the, the whole thing, but say a colored painting of what they think it might look like? What a fantastic idea. I hadn't thought of that. That is a wonderful, wonderful idea. If somebody could do that. Well, maybe if I have a look at the scans, I could have a go. <laughs> oh, wow. That would be great. I think that would be a wonderful, wonderful idea. Uh, what I would also like to do, you know, future work, in addition to doing a positive wood identification, would be to um, do a proper analysis of um, the pigment layers so that we mm -hmm. could identify. That's not something that I have the skills to do, but it's something yeah. that con conservatory. The difficulty would be trying to, trying to work out what colors might have been in this, this dark uh, gesso type thing. Um, Karen, I might have something to respond on that. Uh, Great. You, you said two things that really resonated with me. One was the UV showed presence of gum arabic, and the other one was perhaps a metal dust. Are you familiar with shell gold? Shell I am gold, not. Tell me about that. Shell gold is often used in manuscript making. So when you're gilding something, you put down an adhesive um, that's usually tinted red with bowl called sizing, which I get in a little bottle like this. And then when you put the gold leaf down, which is very, uh, yeah, okay, focus, which is very, very thin and floppy. You can see it there. Um, the gold sticks where you've put the leaf down, but then you brush away all the rest of the gold to leave the pattern you want. What do you do with the rest of the gold? You capture it because it's way too valuable to lose. You grind it into a powder and combine it with gum Arabic. So now you've got Wait. gum Arabic and gold dust and so I capture all my gold crumb and grind it and add it to my little palette here and dump in a little gum arabic and water. And then when I want to use it, I can just paint brush water, re-wet it and paint it on. And so that combines your combination of a met metallic dust you were talking about with the presence of gum arabic. And it was pretty common in, in earlier times in medieval manuscript work. In Wonderful. And this is something that, you know, if we do, if we do a, an uh, analysis of the layers, that, that that certainly could be determined, with, you know, if, if they use that. So that's great. Thank you. Uh, Karen, is, uh, Jana Kernick has asked, she's saying she's amazed that a harp that's, um, even a harp that's 200 years old, that was supposedly a cherished house harp, has so much woodworm. Was it that Hollybrook was so cold and damp that woodworm damaged ha ha happened, or ha well, do you have any comments to make about that? I, I think woodworm damage is really common, and I and for sure in you know these these old houses, um, it it was it was probably almost inevitable if you know something is sitting in storage or if it's well I know there's photographs of the Hollybrook harp. Um, attached high on a on a post at hollybrook house uh, um it's it's i think it's it's probably almost unavoidable in in these you know think of these big old houses uh um you know, karen i can only say as somebody who spent years living in a in a smaller old irish house that yeah woodworm is a is an issue is a th is an it, issue it's a thing it, it's a thing <laughs> really, yeah unfortunately it's a thing. You know, it's that climate in Ireland where it's, you know, cool, damp, moist. Um, I, I would also say that, it, you know, we know about the, ha the harp being a treasured heirloom at Hollybrook House. And we also know about it coming to Sotheby's in 1986. But it only would take 10 years in a shed because nobody knew what to do with it. So, you know, when, when did the woodworm come? It could have been quite recently. It could have been mid 20th century when nobody knew what to do with the harp. And, yeah. stuck it in the garden shed until they got around to calling Sotheby's. So True. you just don't that's know. A, that's a good point. And um, one of the, it, and it, I'm glad this came up because um, someone not, not today, but uh, recently asked me, you know, what, what is done to, to these harps now to take care of them? And the, the Hollybrook is in a climate controlled area, storage area, at the National Museum of Ireland uh, with the, their other collection of early Irish harps so that um, 
woodworm is no longer an active problem um, for this, this harp and the, the other artifacts in their collection. So we're very fortunate that the, these instruments are in a place now where they're being caretaken. Um, if anybody's wondering if you know if it's going to molder away, um, you know, fortunately, it's it's in a it's in a safe place now. I'm just conscious of time, so let me just say we've just gone over the hours. So for anybody who needs to leave, we completely understand, and thank you for joining us. And for anybody who would like to stay, just to carry on, uh, we're going to be here for a while. So feel free to do whatever you need to do. Thank yeah, you. and 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 I hope I thank you so much, everyone, for coming. It's been uh, absolutely wonderful. Um, uh, we had I think almost fifty people, and I also I want to s apologize if my presentation seemed a little bit incoherent and scattered. But I I was cognizant that I gave a talk on this for a number of people last summer, and I didn't want to spend the hour re-giving, you know, going back over all of that. I I wanted to focus on. Um, this database and, and and showing people what's there and, and what people can download. Karen, I had a question um, about the metal strip. And I know that a, a replica hasn't really been put together, an authentic replica, but other harps. How many of the harps had, instead of string shoes, a metal strip going down? And did it affect the sound? Does it change the sound of the instrument in some way? That's a good question. And I don't know the number of how many. I know several of them do. Um, and I think, and Simon can chime in if he wants to. I think it's more common on the later instruments um, than the earlier ones. It's a good question of how does that affect the sound? I, I can instantly yeah. think of Sir Harp, the Otway Harp. Yeah. This one. Mm -hmm. What other ones have a strip? I'm trying to think. Off the, I'd have to go look. Maybe one or two at the very late. Yeah, I mean the boxes. the Lamont harp has sort of pieces of metal strip, mm. and and string shoes, uh, both. Uh, that's I think. And, that's and I don't think you could say how does it affect the sound. The only way to do that would be to have a harp and to fit shoes and then to take them off and then to fit a strip and to compare mm. it because but, but, everything but, affects the sound you know yeah for, for sure i mean that's a really good question and you can sort of think about it you know think about how how does putting mm. this rigid metal strip well this the hollybrook has the metal strip but it doesn't have a particular thickening of the wood does it if you know it at, doesn't if you exactly. go into the files and look at the cross sections you can see that the metal strip has the function or has the same kind of role maybe is that it's thickening that you band. get in other harps yes that's that's a good point thanks for pointing that out simon yeah and that's a really good question uh yeah simon just pointed out on the hollybrook harp on the the sound box there's there's the metal strip but there's no string band now the string band is if you look at a lot of the early irish harps the front of the sound box the soundboard it where the strings come out it's thicker there it's like steps mm -hmm. up there that's the string band and on the on the hollybrook it just has the metal strip that in play instead of this, the string band um so it's sort of taking the function of the string band and for sure yeah it's going to depend on what material now that that metal strip in the hollybrook that's iron uh, it's going to depend on how thick it is, how flexible it is. But yeah, for sure, you've asked a really good question because, you know, is that going to be, you know, that, is it going to be less flexible than a, the, a you know, built-in wooden string band? Uh, how's that going to affect the vibration of the soundboard? It's, you know, these are, these are interesting questions. I suspect that the difference is probably very slight in practice. Uh, the, 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 st the string band will re render the, the wood fairly unyielding relatively uh, at that point. I, I doubt if there's a great deal of difference either way. Thanks for asking that question. Oh, well, thank you for all your work. It's, it's just amazing. It's well, I, amazing. I and I, I hope I um, um, gave people a, a, um, a a good impression of what's available and um, that I wasn't too scattered about it. Uh, but as you can see, there's a lot there. 
and we try to do it to make it accessible to people uh, not only to make it easy to sort of navigate around but also because I'm really cognizant that not everybody wants to manipulate a 3d scan on their computer with mesh lab so I try to make you know a, a comprehensive set of, of cross sections and views and I would like to thank Simon in particular because Simon was the one who taught me how to do that with the uh, 3d scans with the laser scan so thank you Simon for, for the, all of that instruction um, and uh, there's there's as I said there's there's thousands there's over a thousand photographs that people can can sort through and the information isn't limited to just what's in the write-ups uh, could the metal sound band, uh, the okay, band be a fi yeah I'm just reading someone's question there on some of the harp oh on this harp uh the string band do we no I think I think that's original I don't think that's a repair what do you think Simon do you think that metal string band is original or do you think that on, was a repair on the Hollybrook on the Hollybrook yeah no it, it looks original to me and like I say there's no carved wooden thing there's no evidence of there being a carved wooden thing carved away or anything it seems it seems all as a coherent design to me the whole harp seems original and complete I'm not yeah, you know, yeah. some of the harps it's you you start to get a suspicion that one of the components is a replacement or has been recut or fiddled around with and on this harp I'm not seeing that at all yeah it's, now one one big question about this harp is the foot at the base of the sound box it has a very so that's the part where that it balances on when you're holding it up in playing position the base end uh if you recall i showed quickly showed you a picture of the base end of the harp it has a very short foot it basically doesn't stick out beyond the base end of the sound box at all and that there's two holes either side of the foot that um probably held feet to you know two feet uh to like turned feet for the harp to stand up on now was the foot cut short at some time you know maybe it rotted or, or broke or something and so somebody just I, I think it I think it looks like there's saw cuts on the wood yeah but then you pointed out that the, the red color goes exactly. right the way over the bottom of the foot so exactly so there's there's a question here yeah that it looks like yeah there's pigment on the bottom of the foot so it looks like that the harp may have been painted um, with this you know with the decoration that, that that it has with the foot short um, now there's a couple of possibilities maybe you know maybe that pigment's different maybe that was just a repair pigment patch you know somebody repainted or it really was painted when the foot was short and it was painted not when it was brand new but a little bit later you know maybe it originally had a long foot the foot was no good whatever but you also said Karen that there's no wear marks on the bottom of the foot or on the base yes, of the sandbox yes. that's right yeah so and and I think the reason for that is that it would have been resting on those two turned feet that are now missing that it did I don't think it ever rested on that that stubby um stubby end of the foot True. These, so, these two little feet is a feature of German is it bohemian harp Sean that have the two little prong feet that stick out the bottom. Uh, Spanish harps. Spanish harps have pronged feet. The, the, oh, the, sorry. You mean you mean the vertical prong things? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Harps. So, uh, so sorry, harps. Karen. Uh, if I could just stop a second, Karen. Moro Cronin is trying to get back in, and since you're host, oh, you're whoopsie. the only one who can. Let oh, it. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank no, no, you. no, no problem. Uh, yeah, Bohemian harps at the front. <laughs> so, so the harp. Would, gonna... So the harp would stand upright, but it wouldn't. It would tip forward or backwards but it couldn't tip sideways with those two wee feet exactly so that's a bit different to what we're used to with both with modern harps and with old irish harps yeah so there's, there's a little bit of a question there of 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 how it was originally did it originally have the the you you know the usual standard one large central long foot uh the um and that was cut at some point as simon said you can see there's saw marks on it or was it originally made with a short foot um if it was originally made with a long foot that was then cut 
was it decorated afterwards because there's pigment on the cutoff end of that foot. Uh, so that's a that's a question for a heart maker to, you know, make some decisions about. Um, but I can see that I, I would say it it's plausible to me that it was made with the foot longer, and that foot was cut off fairly early on, and that it was painted afterwards with all the decoration. What do you think, Simon? I'm not sure I want to commit to anyone. <laughs> you know, there's any number of stories here. Yeah. And, yeah, there, and as far as I can see, there's no way of choosing between them. Like it was designed with a short foot and stubby feet. It was designed with a long foot painted, cut off, repainted, or, you know, there's, and, and what about the internal panel with holes in? Do you think that's connected to the feet? Do you, th do you think that's original? Do you think it's inserted? You know, this, yeah, it's, that's it's, a question. it all I looks so know. simple. And then when you get to the bottom end of the harp, it all goes pear shaped. It's a little bit weird. Yeah, the bottom end on. of the harp is a little bit weird. Yeah, yes, from a construction standpoint. Uh, Janet is asking, was the curvature uh, of the, you know, the, the lobes of the sound box and the foot at the bottom of the harp merely stylistic remnants of uh, of older harps are, or um, were the feet additions? And again, I don't know. Yeah, I think that's that's a question. We don't know. It's an interesting question. Okay, so Karen, since we're now 15 minutes over, um, and again, I don't want to stop the chat and it can carry on all day. It's a very nice St. Patrick's Day for me, but for anybody who needs to leave, I just want to say the thank yous now and then we can, we can carry on if people have more questions. So thank you so much to Karen for her wonderful presentation today and for being available to us to do this. Thanks to Karen and Simon for their joint work on this project. And thanks to all of you. I can't believe it. We had 60 people um, at this <laughs> at this event today. I mean, this was this was just our sort of this was uh, well, I have to thank Ashling Slater, because it was her idea um, to do something for St. Patrick's Day. And then we finally came around to the idea of this presentation. So thanks to Ashling for, for making it all happen at the beginning. Thanks to uh, Mauro Cronin for working with us on us as well to, to get the word out. Um, thank you to all of the 60 of you who joined us today. It's such a lovely St. Patrick's Day for us all here at the HHSI. Um, thanks again to Uncorla Alien to the Irish Arts Council without whom we wouldn't have had the funding to do this uh, project and to the National Museum of Ireland, who were so kind and were always so generous to us and give us access, access at all hours of the day, night, noon and morning. Um, if you'd like to keep up with our news at the Historical Harp Society of Ireland, you can sign up for our newsletters on our website, which is irishharp.org. Um, we'll have a new website to show you within a week or two, um, but you can, you can sign up already on our old website. Uh, you can follow us on social media, if that's your kind of thing, on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And if you'd like to see more of this kind of research, please consider becoming a member of the Society because it's your support that helps us to do this kind of work that really needs to be done. Um, this event will be available in the coming weeks as a recording on our YouTube channel. Uh, our YouTube channel is called Historical Harp Society of Ireland. And if you go there, you'll be able to access dozens more videos of uh, performance on early Irish harp, uh, workshops and lectures that we've presented over almost two decades now. So uh, come and join the party. We, we, love to have, we love to have company here. And thanks so much to all of our old friends that I see here today, but particularly to all of our new friends. So if you'd like to get in touch, I'd love to know how you've made your way here to us today. If you'd like to tell us a little bit more about what brought you here and what your interest is in our work, we'd love to hear from you. So you can always email us at info at irishharp.org. So thanks very much to all of you. And now carry right on. Well, I, I have to say, I will have to leave in about 10 minutes because my daughter has a, a university class that like so many university students she's doing remotely so she will need access to the internet in about 10 minutes um, but thank you so much and if anybody has further questions please feel free to get in touch in fact you can either get in touch to you know uh, info at irishharp.org or you can get in touch with me uh, karen at karenloomis.com or simon chadwick uh, 
Simon, what's your current email address? I think it's simon at simonchadwick.net. Yes, that's what I was just going to say, but I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> I figured. Thank okay. Karen, uh, Karen, is it too early to ask you what your next project is or what you have in mind for future things to do? You know what? I would, one of the things I would like to do um, besides studying more of these harps is I would, um, I'm thinking about offering online workshops this autumn on uh, early Irish harp research. If people think that's something that they would be interested in, interested in listening to me talk, um, please drop me an email because I would actually uh, like to know if that's something that, that people would like to, to participate in. Um, uh, but uh, besides that, it, for sure, it would be really nice to be able to do what we've done with the Hollybrook harp and creating this resource for other harps. Um, one of yeah, the can, we, can, can we yeah. take two minutes and just say where we are in this work? Because you talked yeah, about Simon, people you studying or study of the you know the study, and I'm thinking there's a few harps that have been well studied, and there's an awful lot that haven't have barely been touched still. And even the ones that have been studied like this, I think this project is quite amazing in terms of the resource, the, the processing you've done, the resources you've put out there. So you can always go back to the ones that, that have been studied and revisit them. But there's a, the harps that haven't been studied yet. This is, I think this is the pressing thing. Like the Sir harp would be the obvious next one. It's in the National Museum beside the other ones that have been scanned and it hasn't been done. And then there are the ones in other collections that are slightly harder to get access to. Um, and I, I, that's a good point, Simon. And I would also be love to hear from people on what they would like to see mm. done. But also I'd like to point out that one of the big stumbling blocks, and I hate, hate to say this, but one of the big st stumbling blocks is funding. Yes, uh, definitely. Because it's, mm. it's outrageously time consuming and expensive work. It, and, all the tech and, stuff, yeah. you know, the commissioning the scan and We'd like to be doing things like commissioning x-rays or CT scans, even when it's possible, you know, all there's so many different procedures you can do, or like Karen was saying, getting the permission to do wood samples to do timber IDs, there's the possibility of carbon dating, there's so many things you could do. But the amount of effort and organizing to do it all is enormous. Yeah, and the and the the amount of time that go that Simon and I put into uh, data processing was, mm. was months of work uh, mm. preparing all of this. So, yeah, so um, that's what we would like to do, but I would love to, to hear from from people um, uh, what you would like. And I think with if we don't have any more questions, um, can, can I also just yeah, say Simon, that, go that ahead. One, of the, one of the things that I think is very important and um, is for people using this stuff, heart makers and other researchers, is to give us feedback about what is useful and what isn't useful or what's missing from it, you know, because neither Karen nor I is a heart maker. And so there's a bit of second guessing here about what information is really useful. So feed feedback, positive, negative, neutral yeah. is very welcome. Thanks. Thanks for mentioning that, Simon. And and one of the advantages of having myself and Simon do this is uh, I know one of the dilemmas for heart makers is if if you're a heart maker and you do manage to ha get the resources to go to the museum and take the time to uh, examine and measure one of the harps and then prepare templates and cross sections and do all of this work um but then you know from a, from the heart makers perspective do you then give all of that information away to other people who are making harps as just a community resource or but then you you've just put in months of your own weeks or months of your own time uh whereas we're we're sort of neutral parties <laughs> um so we're able to, you know, do this. Mm, but I'd, I'd like to encourage heart makers and other researchers to put 
their findings back into the communal pot as oh, well. Oh yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. You know, the more yeah. the more we share information collectively, the more what we know grows much faster than any one of us could ever manage on but our Simon, own. Simon, I think there are two ways of looking at it. You're looking at it with a researcher hat on, but if you're trying to earn your living from um, from a commercial enterprise, you don't have really that if you don't have that luxury if you you know or i are see you, attention i see an understanding oh, but are, you, are you seriously suggesting anyone's earning their living from this stuff <laughs> um yeah pork belters do i mean i i know what you're saying but yeah people do earn their living from it and so it's it's a tricky it's a tricky situa situation i wouldn't censure a heart builder for not sharing information no of course not i'm just encouraging people to think about absolutely how how we can build on each other's well efforts, i suppose like that's where we that's where we come in as an organization in that we don't have a dog in the race we're not trying to make money out of building harps and so we can make information available to everybody on an egalitarian basis but and, to and do it, that we need funding you know it's, yeah yeah and and again just to reiterate that the the issue from the the museum side and and i know this from having worked with various museums that it really is a dilemma for the museums because they you know if they say yes to one person you know they don't want to have to say no to somebody else and you know where is the cutoff for example i know from speaking to the former pe keeper at uh trinity college who was in charge of the the brian brew harp uh he told me that they typically get requests uh, like two requests a week for someone to have them take that harp out so they can measure it and take photographs of it because it's so famous. And I, and I would also say the museum doesn't ever ask for money for that. They, the museum puts its own staff and resource time into allowing this access. So it, every request to the museum costs the museum time and money, if you like. I just wanted to bring up one little, one little thing that you guys are all working on historical accuracy. Um, but, but as a musician, I have to keep my mind open to the possibility that you could bring, you could build something that is a, a replica and it could be absolutely exact. And it could be that the instrument didn't actually, <laughs> wasn't as fabulous um, an instrument as we would wish. So at some point, if I was going to have a heart built that was a replica, I would want I would want to make sure that all those measurements and everything the way that it was put together did actually turn out a good instrument. That's Do you absolutely right. Yeah, oh yeah, I see exactly what you're making. You make a really good point. Are we replicating a nice instrument or are we re replicating a junky instrument? It's like if you were making a replica of a of a car, you know, are you replicating a Porsche or are you replicating a Chevy Chevette, you know, um, for sure. Yeah, and and one thing that we that does help us though, if is if we study the wear marks on these instruments, you can see uh, it gives you an indication of how long and how much they were used. And if you've got a harp that has a, a lot of wear mark on it, you know, deep wear, that's a good indication that that had a lot of use. And if it had a lot of use it was probably chances are it was a it was a decent a instrument. instrument it wasn't one of the junky ones um so that that helps us uh but you absolutely make a good point and also i want to make the point that you know uh i'm absolutely aware that you know there are harp makers and musicians out there who don't necessarily want to play an an exact replica of an historical instrument and that's fine uh this information is out there to not only for the people who want to build an historical replica, but it's also for the people who want to be informed by the information, the historical information on the materials and the construction process. And they want to use that as a starting point for their own creative work. And that's good too. It gives people options for exploration. You can either explore the history or you can go off in another direction, but it gives you the information that, that gives you more options. Thank you, Karen. Thanks so much.
But thank you guys. I'm going to have to leave now, but it was been a pleasure. And I, oh, Natalie, you have your hand up. Hi, Natalie. Hi, hi. <laughs> Sorry, I joined you a bit late because I had something else on earlier. Just wanted to respond to ja Jacqueline's um, uh, comment about uh, about playing a replica or something. Just from from my experience, from what I did when with uh, your measurements of Queen Mary, just making, just copying exactly what Karen had in her in her PhD taught me so much about the instrument. I have to say and taught me so much about the construction techniques and like pretty a lot you know so i think that it's very important to try to make the the instruments as close as possible and have really ex very close measurements because as uh instrument makers in the modern era we actually don't have a clue how they were making them back then and so trying to replicate that we make like that instrument, I think turned out quite well in the end, um, and I think it's, I think it's, it's kind of a learning curve, and I think it's, it's a good, good instrument in the end. So I do think, um, like I don't think that copying a, a good instrument exactly as it was made in the first place is going to bring you to is you you're going to end up with a bad instrument, you know, with something what would be unsuitable for you as a player. This is my opinion. So I think it's it's kind of it's a learning, it's a big learning process for everyone. But so, uh, good replica, if you if you have a good copy of what you can do, you know of what you can make, uh, then then it's probably going to be really worth it. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. My two pence. <laughs> yeah. Martin Holman had his hand up. But you're on mute, we can't hear you. How, how do I get rid of that? Mute, right, yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear yeah. you. Right. Um, yeah, I'm a physicist uh, and I make, I've made lute and I'm making a harp at the moment. One of the things I've got interested in is um, measuring the acoustics of the instrument. And I've set up in my lab here um, the uh, spectrum analyzer for doing the um, spectrum of the sound waves given out and i although i'm not an expert on this i've found this very very interesting of measuring the harmonics and also measuring things like taking all the strings off and measuring the resonance of the of the board this is not on a harp this is on a renaissance lute i made but the principles are just the same it was very interesting just tapping the soundboard to see how the board resonated without the strings on because then that couples with the strings to give you a final sound. Now, how much work, has there been much work done on um, harps on the acoustics of them? There, there has been a little bit of work done on other types of harps. Um, and I can't remember the na author's name who Ian did something. Ian Firth in St. Andrews. Oh, yes, yes. He was a physicist at yes, right. the University of St. Andrews. Andrews. But there hasn't been this type of analysis done on any of the early Irish and Scottish harps. And I think that would be something that would be tremendously useful to do. Karen, would the, would the woodworm be a problem with that? I well, yeah. Well, I mean, there's all sorts of things that are yeah. a factor. There's there's da there's you know damage to the wood. There's the age of the wood. Um, the the, the they, other, sorry. You go ahead. Uh, the other thing I've noticed with the discussion today is how thick the soundboard is on this compared with I, I'm making one which the, the soundboard's only what, six millimeters thick in place and going down a bit thinner. Um, so that would have a very different resonance to, say, a modern folk harp. Yeah, uh, these absolutely, and and uh, you know, well done for your eagle eyes for spotting that. Uh, yeah, and these uh, these uh, early Irish harps typically have th thick soundboards. Yeah, uh, okay. like the, for example, the Queen Mary and the Lama both have very thick soundboards. They're like a centimeter thick, but those two harps i was able to do uh map the soundboards all the way for the whole instrument like, with using the ct scan data and you could see for both of those and it makes sense when you think about it from a uh, acoustics perspective the um, if you think of the the shape of the soundboard it's a, a trapezoid mm -hmm. and um 
both of those harps, the thickness is thinner in the, at the treble end, which makes sense because it's narrower there and it's going to naturally be stiffer there unless you compensate by making mm, it thin. The, the Carolan harp in the National Museum does the same thing in the treble. Mm. Also, when you mention the, the, the Brian Borough harp that's been carved from a solid log, it must have been very difficult when you were cutting through to actually gauge how thick the soundboard was. And it would probably have been quite uneven. So uh, would have had a lot of a very different resonance to a, a more modern, thin soundboard. On yeah, diff different woods used also. Yes, yeah, different woods, yeah. Um, on that, um, I mean, you did mention that it would be poplar was used was that that's very well, willow was a typical um, willow, sorry. yeah willow was a typical wood used for these these types of harps and uh uh it's it's soft and resilient and um so it's it, that's certainly going to have an effect on the sound it's going to give a, a warm resonant sound um i'm sorry i'm going off of the off of memory they're they're you know uh, there's actually a couple of good papers on the acoustical properties of different tone woods. Mm. Um, yeah. Okay, well, th thanks for... Oh, thank you. Well, thank you for bringing that up. That's so wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. I think it would be really interesting to do that kind of... Yeah, but you're right, I see in your message here. Yeah, they're not exactly going to let you start tapping 15th well, century harps. Yeah. And also, because this one isn't can't be strung, because it would just probably fall apart, exactly. yeah, you yeah. can't actually do a full acoustic. Exactly. That, that's why I was thinking on a reproduction exactly yeah. model to do some 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 sounds, yeah. Well, this is, in a way, this is the whole point of the project, is to get people making reproductions. And there's plenty mm -hmm. enough data in on the website to satisfy any maker. I, I'm, strugg I'm struggling building my first one at the moment. So, well, well, well done, well done. Is yours a replica of, of a particular instrument, or is it is it sort of a? No, it's it's taken from some plans um, of a, a book that was published about forty years ago by Gildas, somebody. Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, on there so uh okay well i'm going to have to leave now so thank you so much people but feel free to write to to me or simon or 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 the historical harp society of ireland thank you so much and siobhan i think what i need to do is hand over hosting to you or you take hosting back thanks very much i hope you have a lovely rest of st patrick's day and um, sleep well to mary and hitomi who are in uh, in japan so it's um and to everybody along the way east coast of america um all the way through europe poland uh scotland britain everybody it's just wonderful to see you all thank you so much to everybody and we'll see you again soon so keep in touch with us okay bye